Hello, and welcome to this Murata, ST Microelectronics, Sony Altair, and TruePhone webinar. My name is Katie, and I will be your Global Spec moderator. On your screen right now, you will see all of our presenters today. With us today is Ryan Anderson from Murata Wireless IoT Module Group, Guy Cohen from Sony Semiconductor Israel, Salofo Raza Feindrahaba, ST Microelectronics MDG Group, and Ian Simpson from TruePhone. To read more about our speakers today, please look at the speaker bio window right next to the main presentation window. Now before I hand things off to the presenters today, I would like to share the agenda with you. To start off today, we will introduce you to the 1SE module. We will then talk about the cellular IoT technology. You will then be introduced to the Discovery Cellular Kit. And then we will move into introducing you to TruePhone's global connectivity solutions. We will also finish up today's webinar with the Q&A session. So with that, I'm going to pass things along to our presenters to get this webinar started. Gentlemen, go right ahead. Thanks for the introduction, Katie. The One SE product is a very unique LTE CAD M1 MB1 module. This module is a collaboration of four different companies bringing their respective expertise together into a single module. The One SE module is designed and manufactured by Murata using an LTE chipset from Sony, a SIM processor, an SDK from ST Micro, and it also includes built-in connectivity using the TruePhone network. All of this allows for a rapid development for an LTE module. I will go into more details about the 1SC module on the next few slides. The 1SC module from Rana has everything you need to quickly and easily add LTE connectivity to your new or existing product. First, it has an integrated U.FL connector to make connecting an antenna a straightforward operation. Second, it has a wide power supply range from 3.3 to 5 volts to accommodate IoT applications. Third, the module has many different IO interfaces to support a large array of peripheral devices such as ADCs, SPIs, I2Cs, PWMs, GPIO, and UART. The module is composed of three main parts. An LTE modem using a CAT M1 MB1 chipset from Sony, an ARM Cortex M4 processor from ST, an embedded SIM, otherwise known as an eSIM from ST Micro as well, that includes a TruePhone profile preloaded. We'll move into more details on the next slide. The size of the 1SE is roughly 15 by 18 by 2 millimeters, which is basically the size of a 2032 coin cell battery. The core of the 1SC module is a CAD M1 MB1 module called the 1SC. The 1SC module is fully GCF PTCRB certified to release 13 of the three GPP spec for both CAD M1 and MB1. This certified module also includes a full LTE IP stack. The 1SE, as in Edward, takes this module as a building block and then adds a few other components. A STM32 Cortex M4 processor from ST, external flash, the ST eSIM with a TruePhone profile, and a U.FL connector. The module can also use a plastic external SIM card if needed. ST developed an SDK for this module that allows the end user to quickly develop custom applications on this module without impacting any of the certifications of the module. There is no need for any TruePhone certification when using this module and very little regulatory is required, which we will discuss shortly. Since this module is release 13 compliant, it supports all the advanced sleeping features like EDRX and PSM mode, which will greatly extend the battery life of the module. The 1SE module is certified as a host device and can be easily integrated into your product with no additional carrier certification and possibly no regulatory certification depending on where the module is used in the world. The eSIM is also certified and ready to go out of the box only needing to be activated when the end user chooses to. Many LTE modules can take months to get through the carrier and regulatory certification, sometimes costing tens of thousands of dollars or even more. But you don't have to worry about that with the 1SC so you can get your end product to the market quicker. ST has a vast set of SDK libraries that will also aid in you rapidly developing your application. This too will lead to a quicker time to market. Many people are asking whether CAD M1 or MB1 is available today and has been deployed in their area. Here is a coverage map from the GSMA showing where in the world there is coverage. As you can see, most of the world is covered and many countries are already supporting both CAD M1 and MB1. 
I pulled this map a few days ago from the GSMA website, but knowing how fast new countries are being added, I bet this map is already outdated. So please check the GSMA website directly to get the latest update. There are two types of certifications for the module. One is carrier approval and the other is regulatory approval. Both of these certifications are required to use a LTE module in your product. The one SE module is fully GCF and PTCRB certified for both CAD M1 and MB1. What is GCF and PTCRB? These are the two main governing bodies for LTE certification. Along with these certification, other testing was performed on the module to make sure it is fully certified for the TrueFone network. When dealing with LTE modules, most people do not talk about what frequencies you have certified, but what LTE bands a module is certified with. The 1SE module has 16 bands certified for CAD M1 and 15 bands for MB1. With this many bands being certified, the module truly has worldwide coverage. Don't get me wrong, you cannot use all of these bands in a single country, but the module will scan all these bands looking for the best service in the area. For the modules to operate on these bands legally, this is where the regulatory certification comes into play. Every country in the world will require some type of regulatory certification for the module. The two most common regulatory certifications in the world are FCC and Etsy slash RED. Our module has passed both of these certifications. The even better news for this module is that since it's certified with the U.FL connector, there is no need to worry about the RF trace certification for the FCC. This is a very complicated and extensive process to certify for a module. All this has been done for you. With regards to Etsy Red, we have performed all the Etsy testing that is required at the module level. However, the end product will still need to be CE marked. This is part of the requirement for the Red directive. But you can leverage all of our Etsy test reports for the RF portion, so none of this needs to be repeated. The module also has Australia, ACMA, Taiwan, NCC, Korean, KCC, and Japanese Telex certification. Most of the other countries in the world will use one of these certification test reports for their testing. With all these certifications, the modules can be easily used around the world with minimal testing required on your part. The small size, excellent battery life, fully integrated application processor, embedded SIM, regulatory and carrier certification, and quick time to market make this module a fit for almost any IoT application. Here are a few applications that we see as an extremely good fit for this module. Smart energy, meters, infrastructures, smart city, smart building, smart home, tracking, agriculture, smart sensors. I just want to stress that these are just some of the IoT applications for the module. Honestly, it can be used for almost any wireless application that you see fit. The 1SC module will be available in the distribution channel around the July timeframe. The ST Discovery Kit that uses the 1SC module is available now in distribution at the following companies. Aero, Avnet, Digikey, Future Electronics, Mauser, and Fernell. At this point, I'd like to hand the controls over to Guy from Sony in Israel. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so I will start my slide with a quick view of the cellular domain and its fast evolution through the recent years. The first generation of mobile communications came in the 1980s, only 30 years ago. AMPS is Advanced Mobile Phone Service, which was first approved by the FCC in 1982. For the first time, allowing mobile cellular communication service based on analog voice. 2G and 3G provided significant jumps in capabilities when moving to digital voice and messages based on the GSM technology in, in second generation, and then a wideband voice and packet data based on CDMA and HSPA methods. Leaning on the UMTS and 3GPP standards, 3G coming in early 2000s provided a data weight of around 10 megabits per second. 4G is associated with the LTE long-term evolution notation, coming with a clear goal to increase the capacity and speed of wireless data, LTE changed the air interface moving to OFDMA scheme, OFDMA orthogonal frequency division multiple access. In addition, by redesigning the network architecture to an IP-based system, it improves further the latency compared to previous generations. 
DLT as part of 3GPP releases uh, 8 to 14 and based on its high categories can achieve a data weight uh, level of more than 100 megabits per second. This LT broadband uh, high categories path provided new services such as uh, video and internet apps. At the same time, LT includes a LPWA pass, low power wide area. The low categories include CAT M1 and CAT MB1, CAT MB2. These enable a wide range of cellular devices and services specifically for machine to machine and Internet of Things application. 5G just began deploying worldwide in 2019. Under the pillar of EMBB, Enhanced Mobile Broadband, it aims to provide data weight of 10 gigabits per second. Um, another 5G pillar refers to the Massive Machine Type Communication, MMTC. I will describe further the characteristics of the cellular IoT space, including 5G aspects, in the next slides. But just to summarize this slide, the mobile communication is actually ranked as one of the mankind's breakthrough technologies. Today, over 5 billion people own at least one mobile phone. Um, forecasts show uh, over 5 billion IoT connections based 4G and 5G technologies by 2013. <clears throat> Focusing on the cellular IoT domain, in this slide you can see some of its main characteristics. Maybe a main common factor is that the IoT applications come to address what we call uh, lazy devices, meaning that the device is actually in an asleep or a listening mode in most of its lifetime. Only once in a while it will wake up to deliver a certain amount of data. This practically makes the low power modes of the device critical. In an overall power consumption analysis view, in many use cases, the sleep modes have the most significant impact on an overall power calculation outcome. Another point is that the amount of data to transmit is usually very small. Some cases can be only a few bytes to transfer information collected from a sensor. These points allow a battery-driven IoT devices to reach 10 and more years in field without a need to physically contact them. The overall architecture and design allow lower costs, lower size, and a scale down in its complexity. On the left side of the figure, you can find some examples of such IoT applications. Their KPIs are completely different from the broadband devices, which scale up also in throughput rates, as can be seen here in the right side. As mentioned before, uh, the 1SC module will be an excellent fit for all of these uh, IoT applications. CADM1 and NBIUT include a standardized definition of two power modes. As you can see here in the slide, these are PSM, Power Saving Mode, and EDRX, Extended Discontinuous Reception. The two modes designed for the IoT application and come to allow such devices to reach the long expected battery lifetime in field. The PSM allows the UE to go to a very long period of sleep. In this period, the device will not be reachable to the network at all. Usually it will wake up by its own triggering to send the data to the network and cloud um, only once in a while. As can be seen in the figure, the PSM duration can be in level of days. The duration is agreed by the network based on a defined timer signed as T3412. Um, in a proper and optimized design and configuration, the power consumption in this mode will be extremely low. Unlike PSM, EDRX mode is more suitable to devices that still need to be reachable and respond to the network upon a request. EDRX is actually an extension of the LTE idle DRX mode, which aims a level of 1-2 seconds uh, for the sleep periods. The sleep duration in EDRX can reach up to 40 minutes in CAT M1, which allows to optimize further the power consumption and significantly affect the overall battery lifetime. In a proper planning and consideration, a right approach would be to combine between the two modes in order to achieve maximal capabilities with lowest power consumption loss. So what makes the cellular IoT selection better than other? 
Extending the view and looking on other possible alternatives in the LPWA space, such as Sigfox or lower technologies, we can note several important key points for the cellular IoT products. Um, first thing uh, I would say is that today the technology is really affordable. Based on its KPIs, IoT-based cellular solutions suggest a very low, very low cost uh, frame. Security is a very important item in the IoT domain, of course. Security in the cellular field is based on a very long and proven experience. Guaranteed service over time is assured. Devices in field will be managed in the cloud level. When necessary, firmware upgrade will take place via an optimized FOTA. FOTA, it's firmware over the air process. Cellular coverage will be found almost everywhere. There is no need to install dedicated setups or stations. The IoT device will have global reachability based on a single hardware design. And all these also, makes, also make the cellular-based solution uh, very easy and straightforward to deploy and start operating in the real-life use cases. Going again to the 5G world. <clears throat> 5G originally specified overall markets of interest. Eventually, all the requirements are categorized and put under three main pillars. EMBB, which is the Enhanced Mobile Broadband. URLLC, which stands for Ultra Reliable and Low Latency Communications. And MMTC, for the Massive Machine Type Communication, or Massive IoT in another expression. The CAD M1 and NBIoT categories are practically part of 5G. They are included in 3GPP releases 15 and 16 today. Release 17 comes with a definition for NR RedCap, new radio reduced capability, which aims to further expand the 5G NR ecosystem and potentially enable a growth of even more IoT use cases. Nevertheless, it is not a replacement for the existing categories which answer the LPWA needs. The 5G network will continue supporting existing uh, CADM and NB devices based on a DSS, Dynamic Spectrum Sharing Feature. This feature concept allows 5G new radio and 4G to coexist while sharing the same frequency or, res or spectrum resources. The DSS feature will guarantee the required IoT devices longevity in field. Okay, so this will be my last slide, and I would like to add a few more sentences here on the R1250 integrated chip. The R1250 is a second generation IoT chipset by Sony Semiconductor Israel. Designed from scratch and optimized to answer the LPWA application needs, it shall provide a most suitable solution for the IoT use cases. As a basis for unique capabilities and functionalities, it provides a 5G ready solution supporting both CAD-M and NB-IoT. As a highly integrated solution, it includes baseband, RF, and PMU on the same die. It is based on ultra-low power design, specifically focusing on the IoT use cases, including optimized low power modes such as PSM and EDRX, as I've mentioned before. And of course, it is a globally certified solution which allows an easy deployment almost everywhere. The R1250 IC is a core part of the Moata Type 1 SE module. So that's it from my side. I would like now to hand the control over to Solofo from ST for the next part, introducing ST Micro Discovery Cellular Kit. Thank you very much, Guy, for the introduction. From ST side, I'm going to present the Discovery Board powered by the Emirata module and how it helps our customers to quickly develop a solution. First, this discovery board is designed to address any segment of the market, starting from the mass market, embedded developers, OEM, and large company customer. This kit is affordable for mass market customer and is ready to use to connect to the internet out of the box. The board has a customized antenna, which supports multiple bands to use it around the world. The embedded SIM inside the model, module is um, programmed with a data plan from Tufun, allowing customers to benefit immediately a free of charge connectivity. If the customer wants to use their preferred operator, 
The mobile operator can be downloaded over the air to the embedded SIM using two different connectivity platform. If this is not possible, no worry. The module supports an additional SIM interface to support a plastic SIM card. In addition to the connectivity, the board embeds many useful peripherals to develop different types of device. There is one display, three LEDs, one user button. These are useful for wearable device, for example. In addition to develop a smart application, it embeds many sensors, two environmental sensors, one for humidity and temperature, and the second one for pressure. One more sense sensor supporting 3D accelerometer and 3D magnetometer. If the customer wants to use other peripherals that are not present on the board, we provide as a part of the kit an expansion board supporting different connectors, microbus, grove, and ESP over the STMOD Plus interface to so provide unlimited peripheral support. There is an audio jack at the back to connect the audio headset for a voice call. It is directly controlled by the modem. It is for future use because it requires specific modem firmware. It depends if you, if the your customer wants to test 4D or voice over IP. One USB port is directly connected to the microcontroller. There is uh, for the software development one onboard ST-Link. There is one USB port connected to the modem for advanced debug or to update on the modem firmware. To power the device, you can use one of the USB ports. One USB port is dedicated for power. You can also insert a standard battery at the back side. Uh, we provide two reset buttons, one for the microcontroller and the other one for the modem. The modem reset button, for example, can be used to simulate a modem reset and to check that the overall device is behaving correctly. What are the main benefits of, for our customer to use this board? The first main benefit is the STM32L4. It is a proven widely deployed ultra low power microcontroller in the market. In addition, the customer benefits the ST ecosystem, which include development software tools, a large portfolio of embedded software and libraries from ST and partners. The embedded SIM in the C4 SIM is programmed with a data plan of 50 megabyte for 90 days. It can be extended easily via two phone way portal. The ST4 SIM can also host an embedded secure element tablet in order to store and protect safely sensitive data like keys and certificates needed to establish a secure communication with the cloud over TLS or TTLS. The kit allows customers to develop many kind of application thanks to the onboard, peripherals and expansion. The ST-Link interface facilitates the application development using the PC tools from ST and partners. In addition to the hardware, ST delivered the embedded software, the Xcube Cellular, an STM32 Cube expansion that provides the cellular and connectivity as a service. It means it hides the complexity of cellular modem and connectivity management to the application. The customers and developers do not need to play and understand the IT command from the modem. Xcube Cellular provides a simple function to initialize, start a cellular service and send and receive TCP IP packet. It is delivered in source code with, with a uh, business-friendly license. 
It includes a simple application to demonstrate an end-to-end -end connectivity of the internet and enable the modern low-power PSM. Finally, we provide the board support package software, including drivers and a simple IoT application to demonstrate the onboard peripherals. To help the customer during the development of their project, ST provides a collection of tools that are part of the STM32Cube. It includes PC software tools in one side and embedded software in the other side. The PC tools helps the customer along the product development cycle, from the configuration, development, programming and monitoring. The embedded software tools enable functionality in the microcontroller from driver to middleware and more advanced application-oriented features. PC software tools are shortly described as following. The CubeMX, a graphical tool allowing the customer to select the hardware kit and automatically generate the hardware initialization code needed by the application. For the application development, to generate the code, compile and debug, we deliver three projects ready to use for the popular IDs, which are IR, AMCAL, and the Cube ID. The kit is natively supported by Cube Programmer, a graphical tool to program the application in the flash memory, and if needed, to set some specific configuration of the microcontroller like uh, Option Byte, OTP, and so on. And finally, to fine tune the application, we provide a cube monitor. Basically, it allows to monitor some variables in the application and display them on a graphical interface. And a customer can verify the behavior of their application all the time in real time seamlessly. Regarding the embedded software, it includes uh, two packages. One is the STM32Cube MCU packages, provide comprehensive embedded software platforms specific to each series of microcontroller, which include, in our case, the hardware abstraction layer, HAL, ensuring portability across the STM32 portfolio. It also provides a consistent of uh, uh, middleware components such as um, FreeRTOS, USB stack, TSPSP stack if uh, they are needed for the product. On top of this, uh, we provide as well um, the stm 32 cube expansion packages, which contain embedded software components that complement the functionality of the stm 32 cube MCU package. So it provides a middleware extension and applicative layers. In the context of this discovery board, ST provides and maintains the XCube cellular. The project development process is simplified as much as possible to help customers, embedded developers, IoT evangelists, OEMs, and mass market to make a quickly a prototype. So for that, first the customer buys a discovery board from our distributors. You will find many information about the kit from our website, like user manual, schematics, available software, video for getting started, blogs, wiki page, and so on. And the second step is to download the latest version of Xcube Sailor from our website. Compile the Xcube Sailor using the preferred ID or simply install the pre-compiled binary generated to the flash memory using the cube programmer or simply doing a drag and drop. Then the customer checks that the Xcube server provides end-to-end connectivity as expected using the embedded SIM or using their own SIM current. When the connectivity works fine, the customer can start adding their own application on top of Xcube cellular. The customer can use the example provided from the Xcube cellular or from the cube, other cube expansion. Most of the time, the user will integrate the cloud SDK on top of the Xcube cellular 
we have also partners who will bring their application like lightweight machine to machine client. So stay tuned. Once the software and hardware are fully tested, then the customer can design their actual hardware with all in one module and select the sensors and peripherals that are needed for their product. The process is simplified as much as possible to resist the time to market with less expenses and resources. During the development process, the customer will benefit the support from ST community, Xcube cellular team, FAEs from different regions, and Murata about modern features and Trufon related to network features. In this slide, I present an overview of the system partition inside the module from bottom-up perspective. As you can see, the modem is uh, based on the Murata Type 1 SCDM, based on the AL1250 chipset from Sony. It supports a dual SIM interface. One connected to the uh, SC4 SIM embedded SIM, and the second is uh, to the external SIM, micro SIM slot. The ST4 SIM can be programmed with uh, an embedded secure element applied either from ST or from partner. The STM32 is connected to the modem via STMod Plus like interface, including UART and GPIO. It allows to seamlessly migrate the software running the microcontroller from a module integrated like this one to a dual chip architecture made with a standalone SM32 and external Type 1 SCDM modem if needed. The SM32 is also connected to the ST4 SIM via SPI to let the direct um, uh, communication with the secure element inside the um, ST4 SIM. The Xcube cellular middleware provides a PSD socket API to send and receive TCP IP packet to the internet. A simple API to initialize, configure, start and monitor the cellular services. It will also enhance the communication with the modem using the T command. And it provides direct communication with the ST4 SIM using the APDU protocol over SPI. Finally, it supports as well as uh, the remote SIM provisioning. So for that, the Xcube cellular will um, capture the SIM refresh event and reconfigure automatically the connection that is needed to establish the communication with the cloud with the new SIM profile. On top of the Xcube cellular, we provide um, a PKCS 11 library. This is, um, let's say, a provider service to access the secure element by the application. So it exposes all the services to establish secure connection to the cloud. Finally, the application is using a simple API exposed by Xcube Cellular to initialize and start the cellular service. And in the other side, use the PKCS11 library to send a secure communication with the cloud using a TLS or TTLS. If secure communication is not needed, for sure the user application can directly use the PSD socket API provided by Xcube Cellular. In this slide, I will provide more information about the T4SIM. The ST4 SIM200 is based on the ST33, a secure microcontroller certified common criteria L5, and it is supplied on the smallest available industrial package, WLCSP. The embedded SIM is uh, compliant to the machine to machine specification of the remote SIM provisioning, and it is fully certified by GSMA. The embedded SIM integrates indeed the GSMA architecture, allowing to manage the profile. Basically, a profile contains the operator network sensitive data related to a subscription, such as um, 
the operator creating source file system pin network authentication application and so on uh, the st 4 sim can host up to seven profiles this st 4 sim is entirely developed and product by st in the gsms certified manufacturing site According to standard, it comes with a predefined connectivity provided by Tufan and configured at manufacturing time. The JSMI solution, embedded SIM solution, is fully supported thanks to um, the subscription management platforms, JSMSR and SMTP from Tufan. The ST4 SIM is also able to combine the embedded SIM solution with an embedded secure element section inside the same chip. This embedded section is used to provide secure storage, cryptographic services and also and so on via Java card templates. The template can be installed to ST4 SIM during the manufacturing or using a local interface. Once the ST4 SIM is embedded into the product, the user can install the device at the desired location, power it up to get immediate connectivity using the true phone network, and benefits the remote SIM provisioning services provided by two phone connectivity platforms to update the existing profile or to download and enable a new one. The architecture is designed to be modular and portable to any STM32 MCU. So it, the software components are uh, grouped into driver, middleware, and application. From the driver, we provide the hardware abstraction layer from the STM32 Cube firmware generated by CubeMX. And the BSP comprises the uh, driver for the peripheral on the board, like sensors and uh, the display. On top of this, we provide the IPC, abstracting the, uh, the hardware that is used actually for the communication with the modem. And uh, we provide also AirTOS uh, IL for abstraction, the um, AirTOS that will be used via CMC AirTOS V1 or V2. And on top of that, we provide a CLOS service library, which exposes a low-level driver to exchange the command to the modem. So basically, it is a collection of functions to send uh, a sequence of ET command to the modem. On top of this, we have developed uh, a serial service task, uh, which actually implement um, a state machine to manage and maintain the network connectivity. It controls the modem behavior in order to provide robust and reliable connectivity. It manages uh, the modem power on select the SIM card to be used, and configure the APN and monitor the event related to network service, and actually activate the PDP context accordingly without requiring an explicit configuration from the application. It supports cellular low power configuration, and finally it supports as well the uh, SIM refresh event for the remote SIM provisioning. Then on top of that, we provide two interfaces. One is for the control provided by cellular management and the other one for the uh, communication. So we have two kinds of communication, IP com communication to the cloud using the TCP IP stack. And the other one is uh, using the APDU for communication with the uh, ST4 SIM. So for the uh, TCP IP, we have a two flavor either using the TCP IP on the microcontroller or using the TCP IP running in the modem. So there is a compilation flag to select which one to be used. And finally, we provide um, a basic application to verify the end-to-end -end connectivity. The ECHO allows to send a TCP or UDP package to the network and to an ECHO server and uh, we verified that the response corresponds what we have sent and the ping is uh, simply um, uh, supporting the cmp ping as defined by the standard allowed to measure the latency of the internet communication in addition to the basic uh, echo and ping application 
we have developed a new application to handle peripherals on the board using the BSP driver. This application displays and refresh information on the screen. Basically, it reads regularly the data from the sensors, temperature, humidity, and pressure. Monitor the cellular and network information like RSSI, IP address, SIM status. And initialize also the RTC clock on the STM32 with the date and time received from the internet. It displays all this information on the screen. The application manages also the event from the press button and control the LEDs. Our customer can use this application as an example to develop their own user interface for a wearable device, for example. So, this is my last slide. Now I give the control to Jan to present the two phone services and uh, at the end he will show as well the complete demo out of the box user experience with the discovery board. Jan, it is for you. Thank you, Slofo. Some of you may not have heard of Truefone and what we do, so I thought I'd take a moment to tell you a little bit about Truefone before I explain how we're enabling this board to be connected. Truefone was founded in 2006 with a mission to fundamentally change how we approach mobile connectivity and how businesses, things and people connect to mobile networks. We believe connectivity can be easier, smarter and more efficient. Since 2006, we've built state-of-the-art SIM software intuitive management platforms, and a powerful global network to make this a reality. We were the first company to launch an eSIM app on Apple iOS and support mobile operators from around the world with our GSMA certified remote SIM provisioning platforms for IoT, M2M, and consumer services. We've provisioned over 10 million eSIMs to date, and our complete IoT ecosystem is open and secure. Truefone also operates nine MVNOs, giving us a unique perspective with both vendor and operator routes. We have over 3,500 corporate customers, including 10 of the world's top 12 banks. Every day, our techni technicians engineer better connections between things, people, businesses to make the world smarter. Our headquarters are in London, and we have 16 offices across four continents and continue to expand globally. So what do we offer? We offer one SIM, one SIM with one platform and one contract, giving you high reliability and an award-winning 24-7 customer service. That future proofs you with local experience and lower costs. So what does that mean for you? Well, this board comes with 50 megabytes of data for three months, making you ready to connect from the moment that you activate the SIM. After that, there's options for continuing with your development with simple pay-as-you-go plans, the option to auto-renew, um, all with a single global rate. But ultimately, we offer bespoke pricing options for your mass production. I'm now going to show you a short video that will walk you through enabling your eSIM and how to get connected in no time.
As shown in the video, the IT, IoT connectivity management platform enables you to manage all your SIMs, their subscriptions, and later on all your devices in one place. There are many more features to assist with in-life management, such as business rules, which can optimize cost and detect fraud, amongst others. There are also API options for integration with third-party platforms. We'll be delighted to show you more about how this platform will help you with the connectivity, but you can also see a demo for yourself by following the URL. So we've demonstrated how together we can connect everything everywhere. But this is just the start of the journey, and we look forward to helping you scale up with ease. So thanks for your attention, and I'm now going to hand you over to the moderator for your questions. Gentlemen, thank you all so much for a great presentation. We are going to move right into the Q&A, but first I would like to mention the slide that is on your screen. There is a list of collateral on your screen right now. We also have all of this listed for you right in the related content widget. So feel free to download the PDF of this presentation and to look at all the items in that widget along the bottom of your webinar console. So now we do have some questions that have come in from our attendees, so we're going to move into answering those right now. If we don't get to your question, do not worry. We will have an answer for you following the webinar. So our first question, and Guy, this question looks like it's for you. What are the main differences between CAT-M to NB-IoT? What is better to use? Yeah, so there are several differences between the categories. In general, NB-IoT is suitable for simpler stationary applications. One significant drawback for NB-IoT is related to its uh, photo capability. Due to lower throughputs, mainly in low coverage states, the process can be very problematic in terms of functionality and power consumption. Um, CADM, CADM1 allows higher throughputs, lower latency, and fits also mobile type applications. We actually see a big advantage of supporting both modes on a single device. Eventually, this allows to combine or choose even dynamically the suitable technology based on specific needs and also network support uh, capabilities. It provides another level of flexibility and optimization to meet uh, its own goals. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that answer. Another question here, and Ryan, this one looks like it's for you. If later there comes an FW update on the LTE modem, would the customer need to update their certification? That is a great question. Before we would release any new firmware for the 1SC module, we would make sure it would pass all TruePhone certification as well as regulatory certifications before it would be released to the customer. So the short answer is no, there should be no need to update your certification on the end product. Ryan, thank you so much for that answer. Now, Guy, we're going back to you for this one. How do you choose between E-DRX and PSM power modes? Will PSM necessarily provide better power consumption? Thank you for this question. So also here, it is much depends on the, the exact use case. I would say that the main point to consider is the extent of the device reachability. The PSM is more suitable to applications which can go to a long sleep period and without a need to listen or communicate with the network. In such devices, PSM is a great fit to allow a minimal power consumption. In case the device wake up frequency is small, power consumption will increase and in some point EDRX may show better numbers. Again, EDRX is suitable to devices which have a need to respond to the network faster. Combination of the two modes during device lifetime is usually also a good choice to meet application needs and optimize power consumption. Okay, thank you so much for that answer, Guy. So Ryan, back to you. Any plan to update RHEL 14, specifically NB2? Yes, we do plan on updating the firmware to release 14, specifically NB2. The time frame for this update will probably be closer to the fall 2021 timeframe. Ryan, thank you so much for that answer. Now, Ian, this one is for you. How easy is it to add more devices? Yeah, it's really easy to add another board. Anytime you just log into the portal, and don't forget, it will also give you a single view of all the boards that you have connected. Ian, thank you so much for that answer. Solofo, this one is for you. 
do you plan to provide IoT application protocol, such as MQTT, as part of the Xcube cellular application? Very good point, uh, indeed. We have already provided a basic example of MQTT library in the previous version of Xcube Cellular 5.2.0 which is available on the internet. And we will integrate a more popular MQTT library into the next version. It can be taken from um, the Azure RTOS or from Amazon Free RTOS. The goal is to move forward and provide a more generic service layer to reduce the effort of our customer. It will, ben, it will be um, uh, part of our next um, version of Xcube CLR 6.1.0. This version will support as well the MQTTS using the TLS and using the credentials source stored in the embedded SIM in the ST4 SIM. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we do support as well the machine to machine-to-machine with the Xcube Cellular from the key partners. Indeed, for cellular, lightweight machine-to-machine is the best protocol to optimize the power consumption to reduce the bandwidth, especially in narrow band IoT. In addition, the lightweight machine-to-machine has a built-in services, allowing to support natively device management, like device firmware break, remote configuration, and many other features in a standard way. And Salofo, this one is also for you again. I understand that Xcube Cellular can configure the APN automatically. How does Xcube Cellular know the APN setting that should be used for the connection? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you indeed. It's a very tricky question. Uh, in Xcube Cellular, we maintain a small table of MCC MNC code that is used to, to derivate the APN settings. So if the MCC MNC of the SIM card used is identified, then we will use the pre-programmed APN parameter in this, from this table. This table can be updated later via a firmware update. In addition, we expose API application to provide the APN configuration as well. Indeed, when the lightweight machine-to-machine -machine is used, for example, the APN configuration can be done remotely at runtime, so the application can instruct the Xcube cellular to not use the internal tablet, but um, uh, then use the one provided by the application. Okay, thank you so much for those answers. Ian, this one is for you. Can you connect devices globally, or do they have to be in-country? Connectivity from TruePhone is truly global. There's no need for you to do anything. We manage all the settings for you. We do keep adding to the countries covered as and when they become available. So I do encourage you to keep checking the coverage map on our website or contact us with any questions you may have on our roadmap. Ian, thank you so much for that answer. We have time for one more question today. Guy, this one is for you. Does 5G NR technology replace CAT-M1 and NB-IoT? Okay, so the straightforward answer is actually no. We don't see it replace these technologies. We believe CAT-M1 and NB are here to stay. They will be part of the 5G space and will completely coexist with the 5G NR in the 5G networks. Guy, thank you for that last answer. All right, we're going to wrap up the webinar right here. Also, if you asked a question today and we did not have time for it, we will reach out to you following today's webinar. A huge thank you to all of our presenters for being with us today, and a thank you to all of our audience members for being part of this webinar event. You will be receiving an email from us with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation. You will be able to come back and watch us again or share it with colleagues. Also, please note the related content widget. There's lots of great things in there for you to look at today, so please visit that on your way out. And lastly, please take a moment to complete a survey that will appear on your screen at the end of this webinar. For on-demand viewers, you will find the survey located along the bottom of your attendee console in the survey widget. Again, thank you for taking time to attend this webinar event. Take care, and we will speak with you soon.